Uh, we're delighted to welcome you all to the Royal Irish Academy for tonight's discourse, Explaining Unionism. I'm Dr Mary Kelly, I'm the Treasurer of the Academy. I'm standing in for the President here this evening who would usually open the discourse. He's uh, unavailable tonight. Uh, Academy discourses are the oldest and most renowned uh, series of talks in Ireland. The first discourses were, present were presented in 1786. Historically, they were, they were the occasion reserved for the, the most distinguished academics to, uh, to publish and first reveal and discuss their work uh, in public. Um, that, that things have changed now. Academics usually have different ways of, uh, of uh, publishing their work. Uh, however, the tradition of discourses at the Academy has continued. Uh, and we very often find that at these discourses, and especially at the in-conversation ones such as this, um, that you get a great insight into uh, the work that people are doing. So I do hope that you will do that tonight and that you'll participate in the questions and answers later on as well to make a good, uh, a good discourse of it. Uh, we record these discourses nowadays and they're all available on the Academy's website to listen back or look at again. I would like to acknowledge uh, the additional significance of tonight's discourse, uh, as on this day, 239 years ago, in 1785, the Academy met for the first time at uh, Lord Charlemont's house in Parnell, on Parnell Square, in the building that now houses the Hugh Lane Gallery of Modern Art. Charlemont was the first president of the Academy, and indeed there's a portrait of him on the stairs uh, outside. Uh, before we begin the actual discourse proper, I just have some short academy business to undertake. The minutes of our last discourse, The Geometry of Chaos, From Climate Change to Foundations of Quantum Physics, which was held on the 7th of February 2024, were posted online. Since our members did not inform us of any issues with these minutes, these will be taken as approved and the President will sign the minute book to that effect. Uh, so now, I w would like to welcome our esteemed speakers for this evening's discourse. Uh, so first of all, Linda Irvine, MBE, is a language rights activist from East Belfast. She's a speaker and supporter of the Irish language and is the founder and project leader of the Turris Irish Language Project, which aims to connect people from Protestant communities to their own history with the Irish language. Philip Orr, MRIA, is an independent scholar playwright and public intellectual who brings the fruits of research into the public sphere to advance peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland. He was admitted as a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2018. Glenn Patterson is an award-winning novelist and screenwriter living in Belfast. He's a founding member of Fighting Words Northern Ireland and is the director of the Seamus Heaney Centre at Queen's University Belfast. Our panel chair for this evening is Tommy Gorman formerly the RTE News Northern Editor from 2001 to 2021. His autobiography, Never Better, My Life in Our Times, was published in 2022. Um, now to the discourse. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Tommy, who's going to run things from here on. Tommy, you have about an hour to, for the discussion, and then we'll have about 20 minutes after that for uh, audience participation, questions, uh, and discussion from the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for coming in such numbers. Uh, I hope we're going to have a, a very lively session. Uh, I feel very privileged to be here in your company uh, this evening. Uh, the panel discussion is to explore the different meanings of unionism and how they can be explained to societies outside Northern Ireland. How is Ulster unionism defined? And is it misunderstood in this republic? Uh, some very interesting questions. We were talking upstairs um, about is there such a thing as a typical unionist? Um, and uh, I think that's almost an impossible question to answer or an easy question to answer. I'm going to start with you, Linda, and how would you describe yourself? Do you consider yourself you're a unionist or what is your understanding of unionism? What would you like to share with us in terms of how you see unionism? Okay. 
Well, I always feel uncomfortable when I'm asked to talk about anything connected with unionism because I'm not sure that I define myself as a unionist. I don't think I've ever defined myself as a unionist because, unfortunately, I think unionism and the label unionist has had a lot of negativity surrounding it that I don't want to be particularly connected with. I see myself as being pro-union, but not a unionist. And I know that doesn't actually make sense, but that's how I feel. You know, when I think of unionism, I think of the main parties. I suppose I think of the DUP and I think of the UUP. And when I vote, I've never ever voted for the DUP. I do vote for the UUP because I see them as softer unionists and I, I, I like them. But I would be more an alliance voter myself because that's what I'm more in favour of. If it came to a referendum, am I 100% that I would vote just automatically for the UK? No. I think I'll wait. I think I'll, I'll look at how things are. Would I just automatically vote for United Ireland? No. It'll very much depend on what the situation is at that time. So in that way, can I really claim to be a unionist? I'm not so sure. No. I come from a unionist area. You know, there are people in my family that are unionists. Um, you know, I grew up with people that were unionists. I'm married to what's defined as a loyalist. So I have, a, in some ways, an insider's view and an outsider's view of what is unionism. But I also am very aware that within unionism and within people who are unionists, that's a very wide swathe of people who have all different points of view, all different connections to the union. And if having a, how would you say, an emotional connection to the other island over there is what makes you a unionist, then yes, I am. But if having an allegiance or a loyalty to unionist parties in Northern Ireland, then no, I'm not. And in your case, Irish speaker, developing a love for the Irish language, uh, sharing it with others, the daughter of a communist. Um, do you find that unionism, conventional unionism, as we'd see it from here, that that's suspicious of you, or does it accommodate you? Overall, it has, in many ways, rejected me. That, I think, has changed over the years, and I've seen that very much again with the UUP, not with the, the DUP. Maybe slight softening, which is good to see. But generally, I have felt a sense of rejection because I'm not fitting the box of what some people regard as this is how you should be if you're a Protestant or you're a unionist or you're a member of that community, then you shouldn't speak Irish. You know, you, this is, should be your view. It should all be about the bans, the 12th of July. Now, a lot of Protestants just don't tick that box. And I think unionists need to be very, very careful because when a referendum does come, they're going to be relying on people like me and other people within the Protestant community who are not ticking all those nice little boxes they need them to vote to stay in the UK, and they need nationalist people, soft nationalists, who'll say, well, you know, my heart says Ireland, but actually, you know, so I think what unionism needs to do, it needs to be a lot cleverer, and it needs to woo people who do not seem to have the, just the traditional, you know, unionist mindset. Philip, uh, can you share with us your backstory um, how that has shaped you and where it places you within that umbrella organization of unionism? Backstory. Um, I suppose I really want to start by just saying a little bit about family history. Um, for one thing, um, on my mother's side, I have an ancestor who was hanged in 1798. I've also got a name, a surname, that uh, has to tokens of 1798 in it, the death of William Orr, famously, uh, which happened just before the Rising. And, and added to that story, my own paternal grandfather um, 
never voted ever for unionist parties in the North. He was born in the 1880s probably, and um, when partition came, he never voted again. I think he was an old style, shall we say, union inside the empire. He possibly would have been familiar with the politics of John Redmond and the, the Irish Parliamentary Party and felt completely uh, estranged by what had happened when partition came. So I want to mention those as sort of part of my backstory and my awareness of all that led me in many directions towards, I remember one time keeping a, a, an Irish trickler in my, in my house because I felt uh, some sympathy and interest in you know, the notion of all Ireland belonging. And I was involved with something called the New Ireland Group which uh, was run by Senator John Robb. But I changed in my thinking, and I think I've become more and more, if you like, pro-union. Again, I wouldn't say unionist necessarily, but pro-union. And a lot of it was to do with witnessing my father as a clergyman in the Shankill Road area of Belfast, and subsequently in Rathcool Estate, a big loyalist estate. And I began to see, as I thought, uh, a community that was struggling with a political representation that was not suitable or adequate to it, but also had imbibed, I thought, and a lot of the time, a religious fundamentalism that was not helpful. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying here that a sincere Christian faith, whatever you're, wherever you're coming from, isn't valid, but a fundamentalism that ends stopped development by creating creationism at one end and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ known in, in the north as a rapture at the other end. And when you end stop history like that, you can't conceive of possibly evolving and changing and moving forward, moving on, which of course all cultures have to do. Ireland has had to do it in recent years uh, over the past 20, 30 years with the whole change of the, the makeup and mix of Irish society. So I would say, in a kind of long way, that's where I'm at. I think I'm pro-union. I do think, Linda, there is a difference between being unionist and being pro-union. Um, I spend a lot of my time in England. Um, so I have a lot of fondness for England. I have a lot of font fondness for English culture. I'm fascinated by the way in which Ireland and England have been mingling down through the years. But what I would like to maybe mention, and I'll finish here, I live in Carrick Fergus when I'm in Northern Ireland, and I look out towards Scotland, and I am fascinated by the way in which in Carrick Fergus, you know, I live in I live in a street called Scotch Quarter. Famously, it's in a Louis McNeese poem, if you know Louis McNeese's poetry, but you know Scotch Quarter, where a Scottish settlement was, and it's not all of unionism by any means, but I think there is a component of it that's about looking out towards Scotland rather than looking towards the rest of Ireland. When I think of myself, for example, I've been twice in Cork. Once when I was four, I don't remember it, and once for a few hours about 20 years ago. Not that I wouldn't love to go to Cork, but it's just simply my whole, the way I see things is, uh, it crosses the English, it crosses the channel, and it does so on a daily basis for me as I watch the ferry go to Kern Ryan, past my window, past Scotch Quarter, every single day. Glenn, where do you well, sit in that? How many people have been to Cork, just out of interest? Hands up, have you been to Cork? <laughs> so, like, there are some hands there that aren't up, I'm just, you know, you, you might have been there more often from yeah. Carrick Fergus than a whole lot of people uh, in the room, just checking that. My wife is from Cork, Sorry. by the way, <laughs> just, just letting you know. Before I went there, um, uh, I, I was given a crash course. Uh, I went down as the writer in residence in the early 1990s, and somebody gave me a crash course in how to understand if somebody came to me in Cork and spoke to me, and which was immensely helpful, and I met Ali, so that was great. And then after a couple of years of living in Belfast together, uh, we were going back down in the car, and we got a flat tire just as we went into Cork. And Ali, after two years in Belfast, she said, I'll go, I'll talk to them in the garage because you'll never get it. And uh, I watched her nodding through the windscreen as she talked to the guy who was uh, offering to fix our car. And she got back in and I said, what did he say? And she said, I'm the clue. <laughs> so, 
two years of Belfast. Um, to all, uh, those of you who are from Cork, welcome um, to this evening. Glenn, where, where do you fit in that space? In that, do you consider yourself a unionist? Or who are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that's the question that's often been asked, but with two wee words between the who and are. Um, I think uh, I think Linda what Linda said there is a I th was a brilliant uh, summary I think of uh, of, of the distinctions um, and there are so many things I think unionism is of, often a thing that is thrust upon you um, I, I am sometimes I hear myself referred to as a unionist and and of course you have to kind of try and unpack what that is uh, you are perceived as uh, a unionist that might be as uh, again Linda said you come from a unionist neighborhood or the background uh, but it's not the same as actively voting for uh, a unionist party uh, or identifying yourself primarily as that and I um, similarly have uh, well I won't say I never did because um, you know I did grow up in uh, in a, a unionist loyalist neighborhood um, I you know we we built bonfires um, we you know the the 12th of July was a, was a very very big day the 11th night was even bigger um, and um, none of us would ever have been kissed without bonfires until we uh, you know, so that was just it was license and that was just part of the of the upbringing and I I, I wouldn't say it was unthinking. Uh, but there was an awful lot of it that you didn't have to think too much about. Um, but the, the way in which I now um, think about myself, that word would not be high up on the, on the list of uh, possible identities or identifiers. Um, but in a way, that's okay. I think that um, Philip mentioned Louis McNeese. Um, I think the, the most potent uh, piece of writing uh, possibly in the last century by uh, a writer from this island, but certainly from the north of the island, uh, is uh, Louis McNeese's Snow, um, which is, um, I think, should be our national lyric. Uh, and... Um, it is a, a poem. If you, those of you who, those of you who have been to Cork and also know snow, would you please put up your hands? Um, there you go. Uh, so um, Louis McNeese's "Snow," uh, which talks about the drunkenness of things being various, uh, uh, in the world incorrigibly plural, and so that idea of multiple identities, I think, is something that a lot of people have tried to embrace and that it, you can hold at any one moment, you can hold multiple identities. And in answer to your question, the who are you one, that, was, that used to be the prelude to getting a kick in or worse, because there was only one answer or the other. And uh, now, if somebody asks me what I am, I would say to them, well, pull up a chair, sit down. We've got a long time here before you hit me. Uh, st you know, stop, stop me when you get to the one you don't like. Um, usually Manchester United, that would do it every time. So the, the answer is, uh, who I am is lots of people. Um, you know, uh, we were talking upstairs uh, just before we came down here, and do you feel when you cross what is a porous border, do you feel you're coming to a different place? Do you feel you're coming to a different jurisdiction? Because like most of us from the south, those of us a certain generation, when we travel up north, we were used to the better roads, to Caramac chocolate, to the red post boxes, to the better kept hedges. Now the road situation has changed. The border has disappeared. Um, and it's easier to travel. But there's still that sense of, I think among some people from the south traveling north, there's still a sense of weariness, uh, where they don't feel that this is great, this is, yes, but they don't feel that they're fully connected there, and do you have that sense of difference and disconnection when you come down here, when you come down past Newry and suddenly you're in Dundalk? 
you want to start at the other end? <laughs> well, which you, you know, uh, maybe I, I, with yourself starting. Um, well, obviously, I am married to somebody from Cork uh, now, so I, you know, my 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 twin my cities are at either end of the of the island. Um, I, I wrote a book a couple of years back called um, "The Last Irish Question: Will Six and the Twenty Six Ever Go?" Which was, you know, the graffiti um, when around the place where I grew up, where all of us probably grew up, we would have seen this graffiti six into twenty six won't go, uh, you know, which was the, um, uh, you know, the refusal to countenance uh, a united Ireland. Um, the, I guess the, <coughs> excuse me, the nationalist or republican version of that is twenty six plus six equals one. Um, but I wrote this book uh, really when I was hearing so much post-Brexit about the possibility of a referendum or the pressing for a referendum. And I wondered how much people in the 26 counties were prepared for, interested in um, what that might mean, because it sure as heck isn't just adding two numbers together. Uh, was the rest of Ireland ready for the six? Um, and ready for the changes and what changes might people countenance uh, to their lives, to um, the way in which you, um, the flags you fly, all that stuff. Um, and so I did travel around, it was also COVID was on at the time, so um, it was pretty hard to travel around. And every time restrictions were lifted, I just went to wherever they had been uh, lifted. Thank you awfully um, for, for lifting so early. Um, and. Uh, so it was that was really interesting because I think there, you know, coming to Dublin isn't coming to Ireland in the same way as going to London isn't going to England. Um, and so I think probably for the first time uh, in my entire life, I traveled around an awful lot. And you know, guess what? There are 26 different versions of Ireland. So that's the short answer. Philip? Yeah, um, I think I would echo what Glenn says. You know, my immediate reaction to what you said there, Tommy, was hold hold on a second. There's many different Irelands. Um, and I've, I, I've talked about, uh, about Cork being a long way off to me. <laughs> but Dublin, I've, I've up and down to Dublin and have been many times, many, many times, lived in Harrington Street in a flat for a summer a long time ago. But I just wanted to say something else. Um, I, I read in the Irish Times not so long ago, and correct me if I've got this wrong, in an article, that something like 0.6% of students at, Dubl at Irish universities come from the north. Now, if I've got that wrong, correct me later on. But I think it's a, it's a small percentage. Now, that absolutely fascinates me and also appalls me. And I don't know quite why that is so. The reason it does shock me is because I've just been involved in composing a book, writing a book about Friends School Lisburn. Some of you will maybe know better this, the Friends School in Waterford, founded in 1798. Earlier than that, in 1774, the Friends School in Lisburn was formed. But it's just been fascinating to me that back in the 1930s and in the 40s and in the 50s, people were coming to Dublin all the time to university, regularly so. In fact, the local headmaster who was installed in the 1930s through to the 50s uh, was John Douglas, whose brother was, as I understand it, strongly involved in the Shannon here. And John Douglas, um, a friend of William Glynn, a famous Irish speaker, do you follow me? That there was an interconnection backward and forward between Dublin, well, certainly, and Lisburn, which vanished. And yet, at the same time, we supposedly have a peace process that is meant to be about, you know, um, making the border, as you've put it, more porous. So there we go. That's my I, thoughts. I, I'd be surprised by that statistic. It's certainly with somewhere like Trinity that is Donald Deeney involved in its board. Uh, you'd see a lot of northern connection there. And of course, southerners traveling to northern universities, that's growing mm. um, trend. Um, medical schools, say, for instance, in Derry that's being yeah. planned, there'll be Southerners and that. So I don't know about that, that okay. statistic. Yeah, okay. Um, I've put that statistic out, and I'm, I'm willing to have it challenged. What I, will say, what I will say is that, for example, from Friends School at the moment, 
which I've got to know quite well in writing the book because I taught there. There is nobody going to Dublin University. People are going over to England quite a lot. Almost 40 to 50 percent are going over to England. Not so much Scotland, but England. But there's certainly no, no great sign of, of students coming from the majority would be from, I suppose, a Protestant pro-union background. No, no sign of them going to, to a Southern University. But in, in terms of uh, your, your sense of this place when you come here, uh, it, I was fascinated to hear you talking about watching those ferries, those ships going across, and how you're drawn in some respects across the sea rather than across the border. Is, is that changing? Is that being challenged? Or is that just the way it is? I don't think it's, it's being challenged, except in the way that I referred to it a little earlier, that getting to know loyalist communities, getting to know unionist areas better, getting to know the um, ex-security force community, which I have done quite a bit of work with, um, um, was through a PTSD center, basically, in the north, which deals with um, uh, those who were police who were from various UDR, various involvements in security at the time, and seeing the trauma and the damage of that, um, that has opened my eyes and challenged me about perhaps a slightly romantic view that I had at one time that somehow, in, you know, in right now I could do another 1798, you know, I could be another William Orr, I could be another Archibald Warwick was the relation on my, my mum's side. And, I think that was romanticism on my part, you know? And Linda, with yourself, um, there are Gaeltacht areas. Okay, there's a Gaeltacht in, in West Belfast now. There are Gaeltacht areas uh, blossoming in, in parts of Derry. But of course, you have the Donegal Gaeltacht and the Galway Gaeltacht, and you have Kerry and Cork, where Irish is, and you have the Gaeltacht, you know, growing force south of the border. Do you find an affinity with those places because of your love of the language, or, or do you still feel that you are crossing a border when you come here? Yes and no. Um, I'll, I'll share one story with you. I remember my organisation, we won an award, and it was going to be presented in Dublin, and I travelled down with another couple of Irish speakers from two other organisations in West Belfast, and I remember saying to them, you know, I, I love when you get across the border, you know, that sort of feeling, lovely feeling of freedom or something. And they both said, what border's that, Linda? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my perception of things, I suppose, is, is very different from some people in Northern <laughs> Ireland. And that's just that's just the reality. But I think, when, you know, we talk about that idea of a border. There's things that sort of fascinate me and just in a, a sort of a wee random way because sometimes people from my community talk about the other side of the border as somewhere really, it's alien, totally different from us. We are absolutely 100% different in Northern Ireland. We are Ulster people, but they don't recognize the nine counties of Ulster. And, you know, somebody who'd never really traveled, even within Ireland, you know, when I actually am down at the border and I look across there, well, it doesn't look any different and those people don't really appear any different. But at the same time, distance, you know, when I, I've never been in Cork either, but I've been in Kerry. People were lovely, were very friendly, couldn't understand a word of their Irish, I have to be honest now. And you do feel different, but I also feel very different to people in England. I have an affinity with people in Scotland, but they're not the same as me. So though I am Irish, I'm a different part of Ireland, and I don't lose my Irishness because of that. And I see the border as something, you know, whether you agree with it, being there or not being there, it's an artificial border. You know, we are all Irish people. We're just Irish people in different parts of the island. And I resent, absolutely resent, when somebody, and I'm talking about people from my own community here, tell me that I am not Irish. How dare they? I'm born, I was born in Ireland. I've spent my whole life in Ireland. Of course I'm Irish. I'm British, but I'm still Irish. And a border's not going to change that. Can I ask the three of you about this thing called unionism and the union and the future of the union? Um, do you think that in the society where you live, do you think that is politically sustainable, that it's going to continue, or is the tide going out? Do you feel 
a lack of interest in you, a lack of empathy from Westminster, you know, Conservative government may be going to change next time, Labour government coming in. Do you feel that the plates are shifting politically? Now, you know, some of you have made a plain that you're not supporters of, say, uh, the DUP, the main uh, unionist party. But do you feel that that unionism in some respects, in political terms in particular, that it's a sunset industry? Philip Orr. Just think it was so... <laughs> That we start in the middle this time because we started at the other end. Yeah, you, you. I, what I want to know is what's going to happen to unionism when, and it's not an if, it's a when, the referendum finally happens, when, when the yes vote happens, because under the terms of the referendum, what happens is there's a referendum, and if the majority vote for uh, the status quo, um, then you rerun the referendum in seven years' time, and you keep doing that every seven years, every seven years, every seven years, until the first time there's a vote in favour of a United Ireland, and then you don't run it again. That's it. So you can have, like, it sounds like Brexit. Well, okay, but yeah, but you can have that. So that's that's so the, the odds, I think, are somewhat stacked. Uh, I know Trevor Ringland disagrees with me on this, um, so I'm I'm not I'm not declaring anything. I just think that if you were to look at that, uh, you might think, you know, this might stretch out three centuries every seven years. We just kind of go and do that like you would change your car. Anybody here who's been to Cork knows Louis McNeese and change their car more than once every seven years? Please put... Anyway, so um, I just, uh, I think it's highly likely at some point that might happen. Um, so what happens to those people who think of themselves as unionist then? I think a unionist identity probably will still exist. And I'm really interested to know how, again, what are you going to do? What the, is the rest of the island going to do with a unionist minority? Um, how is that going to be accommodated? What are the things that are going to be offered? Linda is absolutely right about unionism needing to... Uh, make more effort uh, to encourage people who are kind of a little bit indifferent about the about whether to remain part of the United Kingdom or to vote for United Ireland, whether they're Protestant by birth or Catholic by birth. Uh, but similarly, um, there is a, a job of work to be done uh, in talking to unionists or people who identify as unionists or have unionism thrust upon them in the north. So I'm, I'm interested in what happens there. So I don't think that, um, you know, the DUP may come, like everything's going, all of this is going, everything's ending eventually. Somewhere down the line, none of this exists and the land masses move back together. But in the centuries before then, uh, political parties will end. Uh, certain of the ones that are, in, and another manifestation of a unionist party will be in existence that will negotiate that moment where there is perhaps a, a, a united Ireland. But that doesn't mean the end of a unionist identity, a, an affinity with, an identification with the other island. Philip, what, what's your take on that, this sort of pressure on unionism of maybe, it would seem that in some respects the tide is going out. Well, uh, I referred earlier to living in Carrick, Fergus, and I've been fascinated over the past few months when I've been living there when all kinds of fairly catastrophic events have been in the news, including one involving a senior unionist politician. And you may guess, well, if you know the story, who, I, who, who I'm referring to. And I was fascinated by just, as I went up to the local pub and sat there with my friend, just the gaiety and the enjoyment and the ongoing nature of life. Um, there have been, I think, for you, people from a unionist background, so many catastrophes, political catastrophes, that have happened to them. I think that is a real factor. I mean, I mentioned earlier when we were talking upstairs, when you discover that someone who was in charge of the Irish Republican Army is suddenly in charge of your children as a Minister of Education in a new state, a new version of the state post uh, Good Friday Agreement, you're pretty unshockable. And I think... Um, it may I, have I, happened down here before, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But, you know, it, it's, yes, I mean, if you go back to the, to the foundation of the state and so on, yes, and, and, and that is true. But I think that um, the point I'm making is that there's a certain degree of um, inuring and in being inured to the experiences of, of the past few, few months. And I think also then that as time goes on, people will survive, and I think Glenn is right, people will keep on going and keep on living with a, with a, a perspective that is very much um, pro-union. But who knows, things may, may indeed change after the referendum. I'm a bit suspicious of plebiscites, as, as you indicated, you know, the 1%. I've, I've heard Republicans in Belfast talk about once we get 51%, we're there. And, you know, all the evidence of plebiscites around the world would suggest that they have, they're potentially volatile material and that they have to find some other way of being consensual. And I think that that would be the important thing. Linda? Okay, well, I, I think the fortunes of unionism obviously lies within unionism. And what I see is if unionism goes down a hard line road, you know, no, no, never, and they go back to the kind of days of Dr. Paisley and things, then they're not 100% doomed, but they're going to deteriorate and they're going to drop. I would be a big supporter of Doug Beatty, who has obviously taken a softer line. I think one of the problems that the UUP has had is they have softer, hard, softer, hard every time the leadership changes, and so voters don't know where they are. So I think they have to have courage and they have to stick with Doug Beatty, they have to stick with his ethos, with his policies, even though they're not getting the rewards. I think eventually they will, because I think what's happening is younger people are much softer in their attitudes, they're much more liberal in their attitudes. And I think if the UUP hold their ground and hold that more liberal viewpoint and become even more liberal, then I think eventually we'll see the DUP numbers going down and the UUP coming up. And maybe, who knows, we could have a reverse of fortunes that, you know, when the DUP was the tiny party and the UUP were in charge. But, you know, you can see the middle ground, the like of the alliance coming up and the UUP could threaten that very easily, but only, only if they, they are, have the courage and don't go down the, oh, well, my goodness, they're all voting for the DUP, so let's try and be another DUP, because if you're going to vote for the DUP, you're going to vote for the DUP. You're not going to vote for the UUP, so why try and pretend to be the DUP, you know? So I think that it really lies with the UUP if they want to be... Um, or sorry, with the, the unionist parties, if they want to be a relevant party that appeals to voters in Northern Ireland, they have to recognise that society in Northern Ireland is changing and people are becoming more liberal and they are, you know, softening their views and they're not signing up as much to the, the old sort of tribal um, thoughts. There's mixed marriages, people are, you know, new communities, they're thinking about Brexit, they're thinking about, you know, would a United Ireland be better? Should I stay with the UK? Well, if they want to keep people in the UK, make it an attractive place. You know, make it welcoming to everybody. And don't say things like, no Irish language, no this, no that, immigrants out, you know. That's not going to work at all. So I think, as I say, it lies within the unionist parties how they make Northern Ireland, how they sell it. And some of them aren't doing a very good job at the minute. I, I think what you might pick up a, a, in a place like this, on a gathering like this, is that there's a recognition uh, here that things are changing. You know, you see more and more academics carrying out surveys. How much would it cost for United Ireland? You see the rise of Sinn Féin, you know, where its priorities lie in terms of a border poll. But there's also a huge relief that, you know, last year for the first year there was no troubles-related, paramilitary-related death in Northern Ireland, and people here see that as a success, and they want that to continue. And I think people are thirsting for knowledge about how they can make the debate uh, a more positive exchange. Could I, well, one, one thing that would be really, really, really helpful is that all the conversations about a referendum included what happens when the first vote is to remain exactly as we are. Because that bit, you know, the, 
the conversation, the start of the conversation is fine, but you have to allow that there are different possibilities for the outcome. Now, I think that one of the things that perhaps uh, would either alarm a lot of people uh, up there or um, make them feel somewhat antagonistic to it is that they're not hearing the possibility of how Ireland carries on for at least another seven years uh, as we are. And that's the bit, so I think that it sounds a little bit disingenuous. It's not a conversation if you already know, it's not a question if you already know what the answer is. But, that, but that's, that's a, that in itself is a very interesting point because if you did have a referendum and if, if it was for the status quo, then it means for seven years, there's no more referendum. You have to wait seven years. So you can look at that in a positive way. You can say, okay, things are quiet for the next seven years. Or you start can say, planning. Yeah, but that's, that's the thing. That start planning for what that would be like. And th that, so everybody's talking about planning for what happens when the, the vote is for... I can't remember which is yes and which is no. Anyway, for the bit that where 26 plus 6 equals 1, there are wedding bells, confetti, and all that sort of stuff. Um, that, you know, for that moment, we're talking about what happens. Well... I, you know, it just seems to me it's pretty logical to talk about the other bit as well, how Ireland lives, uh, how we all live on the island of Ireland, uh, with one part of it being part of the United Kingdom and one part not. The, if I could just say something that I think the two people who I'm sitting here with on the stage, have, they've been so important in my own life, uh, in the way I think about uh, the place that I come from, the... Um, the community word that we're also f afraid of, because it just sounds like side, um, they represent uh, what I have always thought was empowering about where I come from and the background that I come from, that it is actually so various, um, that it does include people who were in the Communist Party, it does in include the people, the radical Presbyterians of 1798, it does include the Irish language, it is all of those things. And, um, and I lost my thread. There was a thread and it just well, got lost. Can, can I throw this question to the three of you? Brexit. You can say, hold on, you can say it was a destabilizing force, that everything was Tickety boo until then, things are ticking along grand. Or you can say that Brexit has created this situation where Northern Ireland has the chance to have the best of both worlds, where it can live in harmony with the South next door, uh, where both jurisdictions can attract foreign direct investment because of their unique identity. So, which view do you take of Brexit? Could it be, ultimately, could it be a positive thing that could help? the union to discover a new identity that's sustainable for unionism? Or is it something that's going to accelerate the debate towards the United Ireland? Two completely different views. Well, I think, you know, the last lot of years has been very destabilizing because of Brexit and it's raised all sorts of questions that weren't coming up in the future. You know, I suppose what I'm going to say is I had never heard people openly in my own community talking about the possibility of voting for United Ireland, there being a United Ireland. It was just a closed conversation. So that I found strange, I suppose, but also maybe in a way liberating, you know, because as I say, I'm not sure what way I would vote. And I think that, you know, that's up to me. And I'd like to see in Northern Ireland the freedom for people within the nationalist community, people in the unionist community, to decide not on the old tribalism, but actually on the question and the answer, you know, whether it happens in 10 years of referendum or 20 years, what is going to be good for us? What's going to be good for, you know, for both parts of our country, for the South and for Northern Ireland? I hope it won't be like Brexit. I hope people will actually get factual information and I hope they'll have peace and confidence to sit down and work it out for themselves and decide, you know, this is what I would like. 
this would work for me, this would work for my family, my children, my grandchildren, rather than I'm Catholic so I must do this, or I'm Protestant so I must do this, or otherwise I'm going to be viewed as a traitor or whatever. So in some ways, though, it has been destabilizing, and there's been many times I've thought, what on earth did they start all that for? And maybe I still feel like that at certain times because it has seemed to have brought a lot of, a lot of trouble with Brexit, but it has opened conversations that I suppose have to be had. Philip? Yeah, I think tied up with Brexit has been the emergence of strong Scottish nationalism. Now, the Scottish Nationalist National Party is in some difficulties at the moment, for sure, but I think there has been a real surge of uh, awareness in Scotland of being a very distinctive place that perhaps merits um, having a status as one of the Northern European independent countries. So I think that has been um, a, bit, a bit difficult for many in, in the unionist community to, to handle and to appreciate that you know, Scotland, uh, well, let me put it this way. I remember one time on the Falls Road seeing Scottish flags go up outside a Republican club for the first time. You follow me? Whereas they were always on the loyalist side. Um, so I think tied up with Brexit has been the Scottish issue, and I think that's that's a very interesting one, and perhaps a, sometimes a conundrum for for unionists. But I want to say that some of the work that uh, that I remember doing cross community work in places like Ardoyne and um, Woodville, loyalist and Republican areas in Belfast, we tossed a lot of these things around. And one of the things was, would you be prepared to give up your flag? Now I don't mean give up the union flag. I mean give up the tricolour. If the Irish tricolour is no longer, uh, you know, simply a given, but can be put on the table as a bargaining tool, would you be prepared in the audience, for example, to say, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll give up the tricolour. I know it says green, white, and orange, and it is an inclusive flag by its origins, but to many people, it may not have, it may have been coloured, you know, red with blood because of what happened during the conflict. So, you know, and one could think of other bargaining points as well, you know, that might need to be made. So, you know, the changes, if there ever is a, a, some kind of settlement on Ireland that makes it more cohesive, the changes would need to be on all sides. Glenn? I just found the end of the thread that I was looking for earlier on, so I, I crossed both, both my fingers, but it sort of relates to that because it, what I was trying to say was that over a period of a few decades, I think there have been such interesting conversations uh, in the North. And I think a lot of them have emanated from people who have felt uh, ill at ease with that label of unionism and talking about uh, who they are and how they relate to the rest of this island and to the other island. And what I think, bef predating the ceasefires, there was this sense that perhaps what we needed to do was to look at, I think probably it's, it's written into the language now of the, of the Good Friday Agreement, this, this phrase, the totality of relationships. So I thought that really was true, that you know, the, both these islands were going to look at how we all existed, how we existed next to each other, and uh, respected the uh, cultural interpenetration, uh, how much of Ireland is in England. Um, you know, to me, London and Dublin, the south of England, the south of they're, they're so much closer than, you know, Belfast and Dublin. I lived in Manchester for years. I felt far more at home in Manchester than any other bit of it, because I recognized that it looked like Belfast. Um, so I thought, you know, that's what we needed to do, and I think that's what I was trying to say when um, mentioning Philip and Linda. I think that they have been part of that thinking again about how we live on the island and uh, the two islands uh, side by side. Um, just to pick up on on, on the Brexit, uh, the 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 vote. Um, I mean, it clearly it has been destabilizing. There is a there is a bit of me that thinks um, you know I'm, I would not write off Brexiteers. Uh, I, I would not assume that I know how anybody who's a friend of mine voted because, as with everything, you look at what the government you've got is, and you look around, and you think, well, somebody here voted for that, um, and uh, you, you know there 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 is no thing that is ever 
uh, no union, no um, uh, association of nations, no nation that has existed from you know the dawn of time to the present day. All of these things will eventually end, and you should never be part of something that you cannot vote to leave. That seems to me to be a fundamental. You might hate it, um, but I will respect the democratic wish of the majority. That is that is what it is to be a Democrat. So um, I, I Brexit, I absolutely hate. Um, I am a European, um, and uh, I will be a Euro I'm a European whether um, the United Kingdom is part of the European Union or not. That doesn't stop me being a European. Um, but uh, the, the what Philip said there about you know all those things on the table and how do you change what would you what would you give up? Um, I think that is part of the of the the conversation that ought to be having. And I, I've got to tell you, my experience when I was writing that six and the twenty six book was that we'll give up anything except all the things that you're going to suggest that we'll give up. Um, we'll give up the penny black stamp. How's that for you? Um, yeah. Um, do you know what I'd love to, I'd love you to do? Um, we've been listening to your views and how you're analysing things, and I'd just like you to share with the audience what you're at in your own professional lives at the moment, what projects you're on, what direction your careers are taking, because that will give some insights as well for our audience. So maybe, Philip, I'd start with you. Yeah, um, I was heavily, well, I was a teacher for many, many years, um, partly in a Quaker school. And then after that, I was involved for many, many years in what I would call a kind of community work, which involved you trying to use the arts in, um, in, in different community contexts. I'll just mention this before I talk about what I'm doing now, if you don't mind. Um, well, for example, uh, we wrote a play, myself and another person would write a play. We would trial it in the community, we'd take it around different community groups, and then we'd have a discussion. And the play was always about some white hot topic in Irish history. And the discussions and the debates that we had about it at a grassroots level were absolutely fascinating. However, um, I decided um, just a few years back that I w always had cherished the idea of being a counsellor, working as a psychotherapist, and I trained in it. And so now I'm living mostly in Carrick Fergus, but also partly where my partner lives in uh, Hertfordshire. And I'm working in, um, in therapy and working as a therapist. One of the things that does interest me greatly is the role of fundamentalist childhoods in how the politics of the north of Ireland was shaped inside unionist politics. Now, I'm not talking about evangelical. I'm not talking about you know Christ, sincere Christian faith. I'm talking about the kind of thing that I grew up in which was there's a rapture coming very quickly with Jesus Christ coming back. You're a pretty sinful guy. You're in trouble. You're in real danger. And there's, there's a, a kind of totality of belief system that embraces you and, and, and takes, you, takes you over. Um, and so I've trained up in, uh, as part of my training as, as, a, as a therapist in fundamentalist childhood abuse and how, and this is a phrase that comes from America, but it, I think it's very true, how religious trauma can impact you. And um, I, I do think, I think I alluded to it earlier, the way in which fundamentalism end stops development by, by setting up the notion of a young earth creationism prior to us being around here, and then and it ends up with a sudden bang of Jesus coming back. And that prevents movement and I think that there's a real political dimension to then the kind of work that I would like to be a little bit involved in. Glenn, I, I think the, the Northern Bank, that was your work, wasn't it? The Northern the Bank. The Northern guys. Bank job, yeah. yeah. I, I, um, the, I, I don't. Yeah. That was a great yeah, yeah, BBC. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> it was uh, me. What's that? That was a wonderful BBC Thank series. You. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, a radio series uh, that was turned into a, a podcast. Uh, as now everything that goes on the radio becomes a podcast. Um, so, yeah, <coughs> I get emotional just thinking about it. 26 and a half million. <coughs> anyway, so yeah, I did that. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a couple of radio things um, at the minute. I'm, I'm writing a screenplay about, uh, about Louis McNeese. Could you have guessed that? No? Um, snow? No, not about snow, about Autumn, uh, Autumn Journal. 
his uh, his great long poem poem of 1938, which actually is not just one of the great works of uh, the pre-war era, and um, one of the great long poems uh, in the English language. It's also um, increasingly uh, feels very very pertinent again. Um, he was writing that just uh, in what looked like the, the last months before the start of the Second World War, which everybody was expecting in the autumn of 1938. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on that, on that screenplay. Um, I'm director of the Seamus Heaney Centre at Queen's University Belfast, and we're just about to move into uh, a new building uh, at the university. Um, so... Yeah, a How is that going? Pieces. How's that going? Yeah. Uh, it's good. Everybody's got a couple of quid. We're still fundraising. Just saying. Uh, I just saw there was an honesty box out there. I might just put another wee label over that this evening. Uh, you see Seamus Heaney. No, uh, it's going okay. Um, we Seamus Heaney Centre at Queen's. It was open 20 years ago. Um, and uh, it was a centre for poetry. But it was also, from the very beginning, a centre for creative writing. And um, so, you know, it's, a, it's like Seamus Heaney himself. Um, it's a place that's interested in poetry, but you know, Seamus was a broadcaster of note. He was a dramatist. He was a translator. Um, so all of those uh, facets of uh, his writing life are reflected in the, in the stuff that we do. And Linda, the Taurus, how, how is the project going? No, Taurus is going really, really well. It has grown year on year. Um, what numbers? What sort of numbers? Well, this year we signed up about 500 people for classes. We have about 22, 23 classes per week. In, in East Belfast? In East Belfast, all levels and abilities. Um, we have a lot of Bunrang classes, but we also go right up the Ardrang. We um, started to raise money a few years ago to send people to university, so we have a good number of people who have done the diploma at Ulster University, and this year, during the summer, we will have five people who will graduate from both Ulster University and Queen's University with degrees in Irish, so I'm really, really proud of that. My biggest piece of work has been our knee school, our nursery school. So we started that three years ago. We're in our third year of our operation. Didn't start off well, we had a bit of intimidation and threats and had to move a few times, but we got money from the Irish government. I'm very, very grateful to the Irish government because we've got almost half a million pounds through the Shared Island Fund and we will move from a Presbyterian church, a, a shared space, into our own space this summer and open up in September, not just as the knee skull, but as a bun skull. We are absolutely unique because we are part of the integrated sector, but we teach through Irish medium, so we're the only integrated school, nursery school, that teaches through Irish. And as I say, we started off with very controversial um, intimidation and threats, and now we're just becoming part of the community, part of the fabric of the community. We've had a, a couple of really lovely things where um, the Craigie Road in, Belf in East Belfast, we were out sort of giving out um, leaflets about the Nice Skull and Bun Skull at a, a local event. And, you know, we were sort of targeting young families. And I'd say 99% of the young families that we spoke to said, oh, no, we're already signed up. We know all about you. We've signed up. And we were up in a, a housing estate giving out leaflets and there was a young fella walking down with a dog and I went over to give him a leaflet and I always start with, you know, we're part of the integrated sector. And he said, you're that Irish school, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, me and my partner don't have any children, but we're trying and we've already, <laughs> we have already discussed it and they will be going to you. So I said, I'm more, good luck. <laughs> and are you having any, are there adult classes as well? Oh yeah, we, as I'm saying, we have about 20, 22, 23 adult classes every week. So from all levels of ability. Um, we have a singing class, we have a storytelling class, we have a reading class, we have a family class once a month. So no, it's really, really vibrant. We also started an initiative probably last year, group of Mantaracti um, mentor groups, and we have about 150 people involved in that. So the people that have been with us for a good lot of years, who started off you know, in Bunrang, who are now getting the language, they mentor small groups, maybe three or four people. And the lovely thing about that is it, it helps with the fallout, it, it helps to encourage people, supports them in their learning. Um, it's also fantastic for the mentors themselves because it really gives them a bit of drive and a bit of ambition. 
but it also creates community. And I always pride myself on Taurus, you know, my organization, that just, you know, we're an Irish language provider, but we're more than that. We are a community of learners and speakers. We're just people coming together, people learning the language. And the majority of our learners are from the Protestant community because we're based in East Belfast, but we're very cross community. And I always say, you know, it's just people coming together, friendships being created. We've even had two marriages. And I used to say one baby, but another baby was born a few days ago. So now, two marriages, two babies, and another one on the way. So there you go. Just, just one final question on that. Is there any Ulster Scots dimension to your work? Yeah, we do. We delve a little bit into the Ulster Scots. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, from my own personal point of view, I had no interest whatsoever in Ulster Scots until I tar- started to learn Irish. You know, I always kind of viewed it like a bit of, you know, I was a bit ridiculous, that's not a language. And it was Irish speakers who pulled me up and said, hold on a wee minute, Linda, you need to look at that. Also, people who had no no interest in Ulster Scots, but they were going to use it as a stick to beat me with, which again forced me to have a look at what it is. And one of the things that really, really interested me was when I realised that Scots is a language and Ulster Scots is a dialect of Scots. That's the official line. But they overlap. If you look at Scots and Ulster Scots, it's full of Gaelic, absolutely full of Gaelic. So when you embrace one, you're really embracing the other. And I say that to Irish speakers and I say it to the Scots and Ulster Scots speakers. If you start ridiculing the other, you're ridiculing your own language. And as people in Ulster, and further afield, Donegal and, and whatever, you know, we draw on both of those languages. You know, they're part and parcel of who we are. They're part and parcel of our identity. And again, it's another thing that I resent this being put into a box. Well, you're Protestant, so Ulster Scots is your thing. You're Catholic, Irish is your thing. That is just wrong. It's incorrect because we draw on it all, and why shouldn't we? We're surrounded by these languages. They don't take anything away from us, and the fact that we can have both, it enriches us. Uh, it's, it's a sort of a perfect end line. If you ridicule something in a way, you're ridiculing yourself. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of our panel, to our three panelists. Um, Tommy, uh, as chair, did a great job there as a mediator. Uh, Linda, Philip, and Len. Uh, and I'm sure everybody will agree that it was a most interesting and stimulating discourse that I think Glenn summed it up very well there at the end, so I'm not going to even try doing that. Um, just uh, from an academy point of view, I'd like to thank Professor Mary O'Dowd, who she recently stepped down from her position as secretary of the academy, um, but she has been involved uh, in organizing the discourse program over the past three years, and this is the last discourse that she uh, organized. and. Uh, it was really a, a, very, a very good one and a great one, a very stimulating. Um, and I'd just like to welcome um, uh, Professor Dan Carey, uh, who is uh, taking over as the new secretary of the academy, and he's somewhere here with us this evening. He's down there at the back. Uh, welcome, Dan. Uh, and you have a good record now to keep up to with, uh, with the discourses we've had. So uh, just to finish up, the next discourse uh, in the series will be the future of the EU, bigger and better. And that's a conversation between EU Commissioner Moraid McGuinness and broadcaster Olivia O'Leary, MRIA. And that will take place on the 23rd of May. So uh, anybody and everybody is welcome to come again. And I'm sure we'll see some of you here and a different audience and lots of, lots of stimulating questions as well and discussion. So thank you all for attending tonight's discourse. And do please join us now for some refreshments in the front room. Thank you to our speakers and to our audience.